Look at one of my favorite short stories, a Dagoberto Guild's Romero shirt. And this is the first, uh, well, no, no, this is the second, the second short story that's told in third person point of view. We have a narrator. So the main character is not through a first person like we had with the other, some of the other stories. So let's jump right in. And Romero's shirt, uh, is one of those stories that deals wonderfully and specifically with many of our course themes. Juan Romero, a man not unlike many in this country, has had jobs in factories, shops, and stores. He has painted houses, dug ditches, planted trees, hammered, sawed, bolted snake pipes, picked cotton in Chile and pecans, each and for all wages. Along the way, he was married and raised his children. Several years ago, he finally arranged it so that his money might pay for the house he and his family live in. He is still more than 20 years away from being the owner. It is a modest house, even by El Paso standards. The building, in an adobe style, is made of stone which is painted white, though the paint is gradually chipping off or being absorbed by the rock. It has two bedrooms, a den which is used as another, a small dining area, a living room, a kitchen, one bathroom, and a garage which someday he plans to turn into another place to live. Although in a development facing a paved street in a neighborhood, it has the appearance of being on almost half an acre. At the front is a garden of cactus, nopal, acatillo, and agave, and there are weeds that grow tall with yellow flowers which seed into thorn-hard burrs. The rest is dirt and rocks of various sizes, some of which have been lined up to form a narrow path out of the graded dirt, a walkway to the front porch, where, under a tile and one by tongue and groove overhang, are a wooden chair and a love seat, covered by an old bedspread, its legless frame on the red cement slab. Once the porch looked onto oak trees, two of them are dried out stumps. The remaining one has a limb or two which still can produce leaves, but with so many amputations, its future is irreversible. Romero seldom runs water through a garden hose, though in the backyard some patchy grass can almost seem suburban, at least to him when he does. Near the corner of his land in the front, next to the sidewalk, is a juniper shrub, his only bright green plant, and Romero does not want it to yellow and die, so he makes special efforts on his behalf, washing off dust, keeping its leaves neatly pruned and shaped. There is so much going on in this, in this opening paragraph. This is like a, a portrait. It's a, this is a painting. You know, if any of you are writers, this is like writing 101. Uh, let's look at this little. I love Ron Romero. A man not unlike many in this country. So what does that mean? You know, that's that's the beauty of the story. We're, we're singularly zooming in and looking at Juan Romero, but he's a man like so many other. He's a working man, and I love this description. Jobs and factories. He does it all. Romero has done it all, right? He's a He works hard. His life is defined by work. Uh, his house, you know, look at his house. Where does he live? Think of the house. Think of our class themes as the American dream. And what's Romero's house like? It's modest even by El Paso standards. El Paso, Texas, just right over the border. right? It has two bedrooms, a den which is used as another. So let's think. So, so there's Romero and Romero's wife, and there's two boys and a daughter. So I'm curious... You know, Romero and his wife get the primary bedroom. Who gets the other bedroom? Uh, we don't. Is it the is it the daughter or the, the two boys? And then and a den, and then whomever else is left sleeps in the den. A small dining area, living room, a kitchen, one bathroom. We, you know, when I teach this story in class, I always ask, uh, "How many of you have grown up in a family or a house with one bathroom?" I grew up my house when I was growing. We had one bathroom. It sucks, doesn't it? You know, one bathroom. Uh, someday he plans in the garage, another place to live. So this gets you gets you an idea of Romero's living place here, right? And where the, the trees and shrubs and everything Romero does for work, right? And we have the juniper bus at the bottom. Uh, think about this. We'll return to Romero's house is really important. I mean, it's small and modest, but he's proud of it. So here we get some more about Romero's work. I love how the first paragraph of the story 
work, jobs in factories, shops, stores, painted houses, and look at the start of this second paragraph. These days Romero calls himself a handyman. He does odd jobs, which is exactly how he advertises, no job too small, in the throwaway paper. He hangs wallpaper in doors, he paints, lays carpet, does just about anything someone will call and ask him to do. It doesn't earn him much, and sometimes it's barely enough, but he's his own boss. And he's had so many bad jobs over those other years. One's no more dependable. He's learned that this suits him. So Romero does it all. And I think Romero's a great worker. I'd hire Romero to do anything on my house. He's had so many bad jobs. Imagine all the stuff Romero's had to put up with. And just think about it. You know, probably undercut, paid a boss says I'll pay you something doesn't pay you and you know this is what you get you take it or leave it promise work and not work probably racial epithets you know Romero's Mexican right and, and probably all these horrible things that he's rather work he rather Romero trusts himself he works on his own uh, this suits him here's a fascinating part here in this paragraph and Romero continues the trope, too, in our class that Romero doesn't have a college education. I only know if Romero graduated high school. He's smart. He knows about the world, though. This, this, this moment. At one time, Romero did want more, and he believed that he could have it simply through work. But no matter what he did, his children still had to be born at the county hospital. <clears throat> Isn't that what we all believe, the American, you know, if we just work harder, if we just work more, everything will come true. I don't know many people who, so, are, you know, Romero didn't work hard enough? <laughs> I don't know many people who worked harder than Romero and still wasn't enough. What's Romero's American dream? And this is one of our discussion board questions. Romero's American dream wasn't, have, wasn't to have the McMansion and drive the giant... SUV and to have all the fancy stuff. He simply wanted his kids to be treated at the nicer hospital. But it didn't matter how hard he worked. His children still had to be treated and born at the county hospital. Even years later, it was there that his oldest son went for serious medical treatment because Romero couldn't afford the private hospitals. He tried not to worry about how he earned his money. In Mexico, where his parents were born, he spent much of his youth. So many things weren't available and any work which allowed for food, clothes, and housing was to be honored by the standards there. Romero lived well. So, you know, Romero, he's like, this is some critical thinking he's doing here. He's like, it's, you know, I thought I could get more. However, it's better than where I come from. So he's going back and forth. By the standards there, Romero lived well, except this wasn't Mexico. And even though there were those who did worse even here, there were many who did better and had more. And a young Romero too often felt ashamed by what he saw as his failure. What is Romero ashamed of? It, it sure as hell not he didn't work hard. He's, he works hard. It just wasn't enough, right? And But here's a moment of critical thinking that's beautiful. But time passed and he got older. As he saw it, he didn't live in poverty. And here he finally came to realize was where he was where he and his family were going to stay. Life in El Paso was much like the land, hard, but one could make do with what was offered, just as his parents had. Romero always thought it was a beautiful place for a home. So, you know, think of this here. I always ask in class, and students always want to argue, is, is, there, is there a certain time in life where we just settle? And everyone's like, no, you never settle, always. And R Romero just realizes Romero's worked harder than most everyone I've known. And he, it's like, you know, I wanted more. I didn't want my kids to be born at this county hospital. But, but this is the life we have, and it's not bad. It's almost like when you're, you know, you ever watch those HGTV shows, House Hunters. This is like, it's when the starter home becomes the forever home, right? Uh, this, is, this, this paragraph tells a lot about Romero, how hardworking he is but also how he used to seem feel ashamed of it. And here he, he oscillates, goes back and forth again. Yet people he knew left to Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles, San Diego, Denver, Chicago, and came back for holidays with stories of high wages and acquisition. 
you know, why doesn't Romero leave? Why doesn't Romero leave El Paso, try to go to the big city and strike it big? Because he, he has a family to take care of, right? And if he doesn't work out, you know, if it was Romero on his own, he, you can go risk it. You can take that chance. But he has a family and, and a life that he has to take care of and be responsible for. He could lose what he has. And more and more people cross the river in rags, taking work, his work at any price. This is another beautiful moment here. These are the immigrants, right? These are immigrants uh, from Mexico coming over and undercutting Romero. They're taking work cheaper than what Romero will do it for. And Romero, you know, he's like, damn, at first. But then Romero constantly had to discipline himself by remembering the past, how his parents live. You know, he, Romero, this was him at one point. He was one of these people, so he can't begrudge these people just trying for a better life. He had to teach himself to appreciate what he did have. How do we do that? That's a gift, is it not? That, is that a hard thing to do? His car, for example, he kept up since his early 20s. He'd had it painted three times in that period. He worked on it so devotedly that even now it was as in good a condition as almost any car could be. For his children, he tried to offer more. An assortment of clothes for his daughter, lots of toys for his sons. He denied his wife nothing, but she was a woman who asked for little. For himself, it was much less. You know, Romero is one of those guys, and you might have a grandpa or a father. You don't buy Romero gifts. You don't get Romero anything at Christmas or his birthday. He'd get mad. He's like, spend that on bills. And the family who witnesses and sees Romero sacrifice and wants nothing for himself, how could they ask for more? You know, so it's an austere living here. For himself, it was much less. He owned some work clothes and t-shirts necessary for his jobs, as well as a set of good enough, he thought, shirts he'd had since before the car. He kept up a nice pair of custom boots, and in the closet hung a pair of slacks for a wedding or a baptism or important mass. He owned two jackets, a leather one from Mexico and a warm nylon one for cold work days, and he owned a wool plaid Pendleton shirt. Here's the story's namesake here. His favorite piece of clothing, which he'd bought right after the car and before his marriage, because it really was good looking besides being functional, he wore it anywhere and everywhere with confidence that his quality would always be both in style and appropriate. This is Romero's favorite shirt right here, right? All right, keep going. There's an ominous sign. You know, the title is Romero's shirt. We have some symbolism at work here. What's Romero's shirt symbolize? We're going to explore that. The border was less than two miles below Romero's home, and he could see down the dirt street which ran alongside his property, the desert and mountains of Mexico. The street was one of the few in the city which hadn't yet been paved. Romero liked it that way despite the runoff problems, and when heavy rains passed by as they had the day before this day, a night wind had blown hard behind the rains, and the air was so clean he could easily see buildings in Juarez. It was sunny, but a breeze told him to put on his favorite shirt before he pulled the car up alongside the house and dragged over the garden hose to wash it, which was something he still enjoyed doing as much as anything else. He was organized, had a special bucket, a special sponge, and he used warm water from the kitchen sink. When he started soaping the car, he worried about getting his shirt sleeves wet, and once he was moving around, he decided a t-shirt would keep him warm enough. So he took off the wool shirt and draped it conspicuously over the juniper near him. This is, a, this is an important moment here at the corner of his property. He thought that if he couldn't help but see it, he couldn't forget it. And forgetting something outside was losing it. What does that mean? Forgetting something outside was losing it. Where does Romero live? You know, what, what type of area does Romero live? Romero doesn't live in the suburbs, right? And when I was growing up, the suburbs were staunchly middle class. Now, <laughs> to live in the suburbs, you're like upper middle class. You're paying some money. But this isn't the suburbs. But it's also not, remember Sonny's Blues, the projects, the bad area. This isn't a great, forgetting something outside was losing. If you left something outside, like Romero probably tells his kids, bring your bikes and put them in the garage. Leaving something outside, someone's going to steal it. It's not the projects, but it's not the suburbs. It's like this in-between. What's that called? You know, so it's not the greatest area, but it's not the worst area. He lived near a school, and teenagers passed by all the time. And also there was regular foot traffic. Many people walked along the sidewalk in front of his house. Many who had to work. 
Now, I love this next paragraph. The first few times I read this story, I didn't know what the hell it was doing in here. And then it, then it clicked. After the car was washed, Romero went inside and brought out the car wax. Waxing his car was another thing he still liked to do, especially on a weekday like this one when he was by himself, when no one in his family was home. He could work faster. But he took his time, spreading with a damp cloth, waiting, then wiping off the crust with a dry cloth. The exterior done, he went inside the car and waxed the dash, picked up some trash on the floorboard, cleaned out the glove compartment. Then he went for some pliers he kept in a toolbox in the garage, returned and began to wire up the rear license plate, which had lost a nut and bolt, and was hanging awkwardly. As he did this, he thought of other things he might do when he finished, like prune the juniper except his old shears had broken and he hadn't found another used pair because he wouldn't buy them new. What is work to Romero? Romero spends his whole life working. It's the thing that defines him. It's the thing he does more than anything. It's also, work is also, and again, you know, do any of you have like a grandpa or dad? When, even when on their days off, they're always outside working, doing something, working in the garage, mowing the lawn, doing something. They got to keep busy. Why? Romero has to keep busy. Romero isn't sitting on the couch Sunday and watching football for six hours. He's working. It's like therapy. Work is like therapy. The thing that defines his life is a thing he does for therapy, for pleasure. It also keeps his mind busy. Because if, if Romero keeps his mind busy, he's not thinking about what if? What if I went? What if I did this instead of that? What if? What if? It keeps his mind off things. It, it, it keeps him busy. It's, a, it's his therapy. It's his salve. It's his balm. It's what he does. He's constantly working. Here's the old man. An old man walked up to him carrying a garden rake, a hoe, and some shears. He asked Romero if there was some yard work needing to be done. After spring, tall weeds grew many yards, but it seemed a dumb question this time of year, particularly since there was obviously so little ever to be done in Romero's yard. Yeah, if Romero's always working, and think of this, Romero's house is modest, but it looked in tip-top shape. You think you think there's anything that needed to be done in Romero's yard? No. Romero kept his yard looking spick and span. Uh, there were still a few weeds over there, and he could rake the dirt so it would be even level. He clipped a shrub, and probably there was something in the back if you were to look. Romero was usually brusque with requests such as these. But he found the old man unique and like likeable, and he listened and finally asked how much he would want for all those tasks. Romero was usually brusque because I could do it myself. What are you coming here and asking for work in a yard that obviously doesn't need any work? But there's something about... Romero's in a good mood today. Something about this old man tickles Romero's fancy. He likes him, you know. He asked the old man how much he won. The old man thought as quickly as he spoke and threw out a number. Ten. I love... Romero's... Are any of you, like, great negotiators... Romero's a great negotiator. He's had to be because he's been ripped off so many times. Look at Romero's negotiating tactics here. The old man says 10, and all Romero does is Romero repeated the number. 10, 10. Questioningly, and the old man backed up saying, well, 8, 7. Uh, Romero asked if that was for everything yesterday, the old man said, excited that he'd seem to catch a customer. Romero asked if he'd cut the juniper for $3. The old man kept his eyes on the evergreen, disappointed for a second, then thought better of it. Okay, okay, he said, but I've been walking all day. You'll give me lunch. The old man rubbed his striped cotton shirt at his stomach. Romero liked the old man and agreed to it. He told him how he should follow the shape, which was already there, to cut it evenly, to take a few inches off all of it, just like a haircut. Then Romero went outside, scrambled enough eggs and chili and cheese for both of them, and rolled it all into some tortillas. He brought out a beer. The old man was clearly grateful, but since his gratitude was keeping the work from getting done, he might talk an hour about his little ranch in Mexico, about his little turkeys and his pig. Romero excused himself and went inside. Romero was like, enough, enough, enough talk. Get back to work. The old man thanked Romero for the food, and as soon as he was finished with the beer, went after the work sincerely. With dull shears, he sharpened them, so to speak, against a rock wall. The old man sniffed garishly, hopping and jumping around the bush and round and around. It gave Romero such great pleasure to watch that this was all he did from the window. Romero's like, look at this guy. He's having a hell of a time out there. Something about this old man, you know, amuses Romero. The work didn't take long, so the old man was raking up the clippings. Romero brought out a $5 bill. He felt that the old man's dancing around that bush in those baggy old checkered pants was more inspiring than religion. And a couple of extra dollars were a cheap price to see old men, old eyes whiten like a boy's. 
The old man was so pleased he invited Romero to that little ranch of his in Mexico where he was sure they could share some aguardiente or maybe Romero could buy a turkey from him. They were skinny, but they could be fattened. But in any case, they could enjoy a bottle of tequila together with some sweet lemons. The happy old man swore he would come back no matter what, for he could do many things for Romero at his beautiful home. He swore he would return, maybe in a week or two, for surely there was work that needed to be done in the backyard. Th these are some important paragraphs here. Romero wasn't used to feeling so virtuous. Why not? He's had so, you know, Romero's had to harden himself. He's had to build this carapace, this shell around his body, so he could put up with all the bad jobs. He so often was disappointed, so often dwelled on the difficulties of life that he had become hard, guarding against compassion and generosity, so much so that he'd even become spare with his words, even with his family. His wife whispered to the children that this was because he was tired, and since it wasn't untrue, he accepted it as the explanation too. It spared him that worry from having to discuss why he liked working weekends and taking a day off during the week like this one. Is Romero a good father and husband? I think he's an amazing father. However, he, he has this emotional distance. He has this coldness. You know, he's had to... A part of himself has been killed because he's had to stuff it down to take all these jobs to provide for his family. It's almost like Nia, Nia's stubbornness. The very thing that makes, make, makes Romero great his ability to work and put up with anything also cuts a piece of his life off. He's emotionally cold. He's distant. I wouldn't want to go on a long car ride with Romero. It spared him that worry. But now an old man had remade, made Romero wish his family were there with him so he could give as much, much more to them, so he could watch their spin around dances. He missed so many. And Romero swore he would take them all into Juarez that night for dinner. He might even convince them to take a day, maybe two, or drive to his uncle's house in Chihuahua instead because he'd promised that so many years ago. So long ago, they probably thought about somewhere else by now, like San Diego or L.A. Then he'd take them there. They'd go for a week, spend whatever it took. No expense could be so great. And if happiness was as easy as some tacos and a $5 bill, then how stupid it had been of him not to offer all his time. You know, think, think of all the things Romero has missed. Romero probably couldn't go to his son's soccer games his daughter's soccer games. Why? He bought all the cleats. He bought all the He was working. He had to work all the time to, to, to support the family. Uh-oh. The shirt's gone. <laughs> Romero felt so good, felt such relief, he napped on the couch. When he awoke up, he immediately remembered his shirt. That it was already gone before the old man had even arrived. Remember that moment? To leave something outside. He took the shirt off and left it there, and, and someone took it. It wasn't the old man. He remembered they walked around the juniper before it was cut. Nevertheless, the possibility that the old man took it wouldn't leave Romero's mind, since he never believed in letting down, giving in to someone like that old man. The whole experience became suspect. Maybe it was part of some ruse which ended with the old man taking his shirt, some food money. This was how Romero thought, though he held a hope that he'd left it somewhere else that it was a lapse of memory on his part. He went outside, inside, looked everywhere, twice, then one more time after that. His cynicism had flowered, colorful and bitter. Romero knows the old man didn't take the shirt. Romero blames himself for letting his guard down, being kind to the old man. I love the repetition of understand here. Understand that it was his favorite shirt, that he never thought of replacing it, and that its loss was all Romero could keep his mind on. Though he knew very well it wasn't a son, or a daughter, or a wife, or a mother, or father, not a disaster of any kind. It's one, like Romero knows it's not a big deal. Romero knows it's just a shirt, but something about it just, just kills him anyway. He knows nothing bad happened. And the, it was a simple shirt and a true value of things, not very much to lose. But understand also that Romero was a good man who tried to do what was right, and who would harm no one willfully. Understand, you know, this repetition of understand. Understand that Romero was a man who had taught himself to not care, to not want, to not desire for so long that he'd lost many words, avoided many people, kept to himself alone almost always, even when his wife gave him his meals. What type of person teaches him, her, themselves not to care, 
not to want, not desire. Is that even a person anymore? What is that when we, how can a person not care, not want, not desire? It's like you've made yourself a robot. Understand that it was his favorite shirt and that no more than that for him it was no less. Then understand how he felt like a fool paying the old man, who he considered might even have taken it. Like a fool for feeling so friendly and generous, happy when the shirt was already gone. Like a fool for having all those and these thoughts for the love of a wool shirt. Like a fool for not being able to stop thinking them all, but especially the one reminding him that this was what he had always believed in, that loss was what he was most prepared for. Romero, such self-lacerating, uh, masochistic, self-hatred. I'm a fool. I'm a fool. I'm a fool. You know, over and over and over here. It's my fault. I let my guard down. And so then you might understand why he began to stare out the window of his home, waiting for someone to walk by absently with it on, for the thief to pass by careless. He kept a watch out the window. What do you think Romero would do if he saw someone pass by with his shirt on? He would take the garden hoe to them, right? He told them only what had happened as always they left him alone. He stared out that window onto the dirt street, past the acatillos and nopales and agaves, the junipers and oaks and mulberries in front of other homes of brick or stone, painted or not. Passed them to the buildings in Juarez, and he watched the horizon darken, and the sky light up with the moon and stars, and the land spread with shimmering lights, so bright in the dark blot of night. He heard dogs barking until another might bark farther away, and then another, back and forth like that. The small rectangles and squares of their fences plotted out distinctly in his mind's eye as his lids closed. Then he heard a gust of wind bend around his house. And then came the train, the metal rhythm getting closer until it was as close as it could be, the steel pounding the earth like a beating heart, until it diminished and then faded away and then left the air to silence, to its quiet and dark. So still it was like death, or rest, sleep until he could hear a grackle, and then another gust of wind, and then finally a car. This building up here, this this sound, that train, that da 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 he looked down on his daughter, still so young, so beautiful, becoming a woman who would leave that bed for another. His son still boys, and when they were asleep, who dreamed like men when they were awake. And his wife still young in his eyes, in the morning shadows of their bed. Romero went outside. The juniper had been cut just as he wanted. He got so cold and came back in and went to the bed and blankets his wife kept so clean, so neatly arranged as she slept under them without him. And he lay down beside her. Just a devastating ending. Have any of you heard the, the phrase, the straw that breaks the camel's back? You know, this shirt, this sh losing this shirt is the one thing in Romero's life. He kind of like breaks him in a way. Part of me is hoping that Romero will realize, you know, my family's here. I have a happy family. But I don't think Romero will ever let his guard down again. Something in him has, has turned. You know, you know, so think of this American dream, the themes of work and class. You know, Romero did okay, but he, he there was something more. He thought he could get more. And this is one of those things that, you know, the American dream teaches us. If we just work, 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 we'll get everything we want. What happens when we work and it doesn't happen? You know, what happens when we work really, really hard, we bust our backs working and, and it doesn't happen? Or, what's even worse, what if we get the things we think we want and we realize, oh, I don't feel the way I thought I would feel. There's still a gaping hole inside. Will it ever be filled? Will, it, will, will the hole ever be filled? Who knows?